Welcome to the Happiest Ever After podcast. I'm your host, Tatiana Robertson. And yes, you heard right, happy ish. Because this podcast is not about chasing the fairy tale. We've seen behind the curtain, and most of us are ready to hop off the hamster wheel of perfection. If you've ever wondered, how'd I end up in this life? How can I change it? What do I want from life? Is there more? Then this podcast is for you. The fairy tale may not be real. That's the good news because life is an amazing adventure and it's time for you to pick up the pen and write your own story. So let's get started and see where this journey takes us. I'm very excited today to be talking with Nancy Picard, who is a master life coach. She is an amazing woman with an amazing story. I'm not even sure how I came across you, but the minute I did, I was like, I had to reach out because you just have this wealth of experience, this amazing story of how you had a dip and you turned it into a dip instead of a downward spiral. And you just turn things around with all of this power. I've just been so excited to have you on. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. So do you want to give our listeners a little bit about your story? Okay. So it goes back. I was married 26 years, got married really young, especially in today's day. Right. And I was married for 26 years, happily married, two sons. We had a great life. So I thought, but then it stopped working for my ex-husband and he wanted a different life. And it was a really crash. It was a big crash for me. I loved him. I loved our life. I loved the family that I had built. I felt the safety of my kid's life. I mean, honestly, it was just our life came tumbling down and I didn't have the tools that I have today. I did a lot of dating and a lot of trying to fix that picture because I had a shadow belief, which I'll talk about later, that I wasn't safe alone. And so I kept trying to fix that picture. And then I was in another serious relationship. We were living together and engaged in Colorado And when that relationship broke, I thought, oh, my God, like the universe is talking to me and I'm not listening and I have to figure out what I'm doing or who am I attracting. I don't want to be here a third time. It was soul crushing. And I got myself a Debbie Ford coach, a healing your heart coach, which is one of my many certifications. And I did the work. I worked with this coach on and off for a year. And then I became a certified coach and I've been doing it for 10 years. I'm a master coach. I mediate and help other coaches become coaches. That just increases my own strength and ability and what I know because you can't teach what you don't really know inside and out. Then eventually I wrote a book. And the book is about all my experiences and those of my clients. So it's really a how-to. It's called Bigger, Better, Braver, Conquer Your Fears, Embrace Your Courage, and Transform Your Life. And so for those who can't afford to work with a coach one-on-one, this is a great starting point because it really chapter to chapter unfolds with exercises, internal processes, conversations, and teaches you how to do it on your own. That's kind of my story. It's an amazing story. And I want to honor you right now. When you're on the other side of all of that, Mm -hmm. you look back and you can say, I made it through and I'm somewhere better. But when you're in the middle of the anguish of the daily pain of it, Mm -hmm. for you to recognize what you wanted and what you didn't want and to be able to go out and find that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to be out of pain. (laughs) right? You want to get out of pain and not find yourself back in it again, the same way. I completely agree. And sometimes I think when we're in the pain, still making change is painful. And we Mm. think, well, if, if I'm making progress, there shouldn't be pain. Shouldn't I be feeling better yet? But sometimes going through the work, I think that's a, a powerful thing that you took things into your own hands and said, I want better. Did you feel like there was a little part inside you that was just like, I know I deserve a better life than this? I really loved the life I had. So I don't know that that's what I was thinking at the time, either time, actually. I just knew I wanted I wanted out of the pain and I didn't want to be here again. And I knew that there was something I wasn't learning. 
So I yeah. knew that it was inner work. I don't think I knew it the way I know it now. But now I really know that it's really all about you and your inner work and uncovering your disempowering beliefs and unconscious commitments and all the things that I talk about with shadow work. I didn't know any of that then. You can't heal what you can't feel. So you have to go through it. There's no way around it. And there's no timetable on somebody's pain. When you are through it, you're through it. You can't heal what you can't feel. Mm. I've never heard that, but it just really? resonates. Yes, yeah. It, yeah. it resonates so deeply. I'm glad that we get to see each other face to face in mm. Zoom, even though it's not real life. It's a very powerful story because I know I very much relate to the end of a 22 and a half year marriage, an engagement that then ended and then moving to the next phase. I feel like if I only knew five years ago what I know now, I can't imagine in five years from now, I'll be looking back and going, oh, if I only knew today. <laughs> it's true, oh. but I believe that the universe has your back and yes. everything happens for a reason. And so I wasn't ready to receive the gifts or hear them until I got them. If I was ready sooner, I would have gotten them sooner. So I don't look back and say, oh, I wish I had done this. I wish I had known that because if I was supposed to have known it, I would have known it. Lots of times you hear something and you'll think, oh, I wish I'd heard that earlier. And then I realize, no, if I'd heard it earlier, I wouldn't have heard it. Yes. There have been times when I hear it and all of a sudden I'll go, what? But I actually know that it's not the first time I heard it. Yeah. It's that I wasn't ready to hear it yeah. or I wasn't ready to feel it or I wasn't, mm -hmm. there was something in me that resisted what I was hearing because it right. didn't fit in my exactly. worldview of the time. Exactly. That's what and I'm my, saying. Yes, exactly. It makes yeah. so much sense. I would love if you would explain, you've said it a couple of times about the shadow work that you had to do and how you realized that there was sort of this shadow need. Could you explain that for our audience? Yeah, I'm a shadow coach. That's one of my many titles. What a shadow is, is it's your disempowering beliefs that are formed in the first 10 years of your life that are actually in your subconscious. You are not aware of them in your conscious mind and they rule your operating system. And the only way to change them is to uncover them, bring them into your conscious mind, see why they were formed and what the gift was at the time, but actually as an adult, what they're costing you. Because they're formed as a child to keep you safe, but as you get older, they no longer keep you safe. They keep you small. They keep you plain small. They keep you stuck. I'll give you a few examples, and then I'll give you one of my own. Let's say you're seven years old, and you're in class, and you are asked to stand up and read, and you read, and you stumble on a word, and everybody laughs in the class, which happens all the time. In an instant, that child makes a belief, I'm stupid, I'm not good enough, I'm broken. And then they make a conscious commitment that's also really an unconscious commitment to stay quiet so no one will know. Mm -hmm. So they go through their life not sharing their ideas, but it keeps them safe. Nobody ever laughs at them again. Nobody thinks they're yeah. stupid. But then what happens is that they grow up and now they're in business and now they're in meetings and they never share their opinions. And so they get passed over in jobs because people don't even know they have any ideas. So what kept them safe as a child now keeps them small as an adult. When I was five years old, I was playing with a lighter and I put myself on fire. My little whole party dress went up and I was burnt all over. First and second degree burn. So I don't have any scars. And I didn't get in trouble because my parents were just happy I was alive. And I spent a week in the hospital. And so I didn't really think it changed my life in any way. But fast forward, I was divorced and actually I was out of another relationship and I got into a car accident and I had PTSD and my shadow coach at the time said, let's do a session around it. And we did. And what came out was that this little five-year-old girl was still inside me, afraid because now I had once again almost died. And my coach says, what does she want you to know? And she wanted me to know that I wasn't safe alone. Mm. No. That makes total sense for a five-year-old who puts herself on fire. I wasn't safe alone at the time. But as a 50-year-old who is now divorced, I was safe alone, but I didn't think I was. So I kept trying to fix the picture, and I was never happy alone. I was so needy. I, was, I needed a man. I needed to fix that picture. 
And once I uncovered that belief about myself, I could give myself a new empowering belief that I was totally safe alone. I'm financially secure. I'm healthy. My children are grown. I can do anything I want to do. That was a whole better empowered conscious belief than the disempowered one that I had. Wow. That's an amazing example. So thankful that you were okay out of both of those situations. (laughs) Thank you. How amazing. That's the thing is that when we're five years old, the story that we tell ourselves, the belief that we create might not be one that our rational adult self makes sense. Correct. And yet we internalize it. Some more examples would be my voice doesn't matter. I need to please everyone to be loved. I need to be perfect to be loved. Love in life means taking care of others before myself. My voice doesn't matter. People with money are bad people. I'm not good with money. There's just so many. There's so many. I mean, there's a million of them, but all of them funnel down to I'm unworthy. I have a lot of clients who were physically abused as a very young child. They make the belief that they're not good enough or they're unworthy or something's wrong with them or they're unlovable or they need to be invisible to be safe. And therefore they gain 200 pounds. They let themselves go because they don't want to be seen. All of these beliefs are what affect them as adults, and they're just not aware of them. And so you bring situations and people into your life to prove the limitations of your belief. A woman who thinks she's not worthy, she bottom feeds. She only dates like losers because that's all she thinks she's worth. And then she gets to say, see, this is who I get. But that's who she attracts. And then she thinks, I literally have a client who thinks that Anybody who wanted to date her, she needed to be grateful and date them. Wow. Yeah. So that's the work. People come to me because they're unhappy in their job, in their relationship. They want out of a relationship. They want in a relationship. They want to move across the country. They want to leave their lucrative position and try something new. They just lost their partner, you know, whether from divorce or from somebody died and they don't know how to move on. All of these transitions. You're stuck because you don't know what's keeping you stuck. So you have these beliefs and these beliefs also create fears. And then an event happens, you make it mean something, and then you do an action. And that action is really disempowering because the belief was disempowering. So when people come to me and they're they're like, I don't know why I always sabotage myself over and over and over again. And it's because your disempowering belief becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. You you see life through that very small lens and then you try to prove your limitations. Yes. Our brains are really not as smart as we think they are. No, not at all. Uh, at a subconscious level, when you have a belief, this is what I've come to understand. When you have a belief, your brain will do everything it can to prove that you are right. It will look for proof. If you believe that you are unlucky in love, it will demonstrate over and over that's the truth. Yeah, exactly. It's called cognitive dissonance, which means that your brain wants what it knows, Mm -hmm. even if it's not good for you. So if you're an abusive father or an alcoholic parent, you can't believe that you find yourself at some point back in that same relationship. But that's because your brain knows that relationship and is happy with what it knows. I had that experience when I started dating and I had a friend say to me, you are an expert at walking on eggshells. Mm -hmm. And so you went out and found somebody and you started walking on eggshells. And she said, and you went, ah, I know how to do this. Right. And I was like, don't be silly. Why would I try and set myself up like that again? Oh boy, I did. I did. And I was fortunate enough to have a friend who saw what I was doing. But here's the thing. So then at that point, I recognized what I was doing and I saw it, but then I was still stuck because that's just the first stage, bringing it to the conscious understanding. So once you understood, and I want to make this clear to our listeners, so when, when you realized that your five-year-old self was saying, it's not safe to be alone, I'm sure that wasn't the end of the journey. It's yeah. not like you go, oh, I'm afraid to be alone. Okay, okay all done. I'm good. <laughs> so what's the next yeah. thing? First of all, that's an, like an onion that has to be peeled yeah. back. And every time you catch yourself, you're like, oh, there it is again, that belief. 
you peel back another layer and you peel back another layer and it gets easier and easier and easier. The other thing is, is that you have to recognize that your fears are never going to go away. You have to have faith that the universe has your back and whatever happens is supposed to happen, which means if you fall on your face or you succeed, there's lessons and gifts in that right then and there. There's constructive feedback in failure. And maybe it wasn't your time. Maybe you didn't know what you needed to know. Maybe not being picked was actually being chosen. Yeah. You have to really know that everything happens for you, not against you. And take the lessons, look for the lessons, use your life as a laboratory. The juice is in the journey. It's not just success. It's not just the end game. Because the only difference between successful people and not successful people is that the successful people didn't quit. They just kept at it until they finally were successful. And so our disempowering beliefs also create our fears. I have had to learn over and over and over again to move forward with my fear. If you wait to be in a fearless state, you're going to wait the rest of your life. Yeah. So I have gotten really comfortable being uncomfortable. I know it's short term and I know that my growth is on the other side. And so I step in, even if my heart is in my throat, I step in and then I relax in the situation and then I am successful and I move on. And if I'm not successful, I lick my wounds and I say, okay, what worked? What do I want to keep? And what do I want to get rid of? And what can I do differently? I love it. Treating it like a lab, like a science experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's hard. Like it's really hard and it can be really painful. You know, it's in some ways, it's a lot easier to work with a Petri dish than it is with our lives sometimes. Life and is hard. It, it is. is. There's so many times in my life that I'll like, I'll lose five or 10 pounds and I'll, I love this. I love my body like this. This is how I love it. Could I just spray it? And you obviously you can't. And life is the same way. You feel like you're rolling along and everything is really working for you and with you and to you. And, and then, and then something happens again. It's those people who think bad things are not going to happen that have the hardest time with them because bad oh, things do happen. They do. That's they happen to everybody. I agree. Like bad things just happen in life. And yet, what is it that's, that they say? Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Exactly. And then there's a saying that worry is interest paid on a debt you may never owe. Yep. I'll yep. say to my clients who like are basically constipated in worry. And I'll say, listen, if I thought if you stayed home all day and worried, that it would keep that situation from happening, I'd be all there. I'd be all for you. Like, okay, stay home, worry. But it's not. You, you're better off instead of worrying is thinking about what's the worst case scenario and what will you do if that happens? And you'll always survive because if you weren't going to survive, you wouldn't be here today. So you're always going to survive it. What are you going to do? And then also, what could you do to help prevent that worst case scenario? That's worth doing. But just sitting home and worrying on your couch is useless energy. And I think that's when the mind becomes the master instead of the servant, because right. the mind runs away with you with all of these different thoughts. And that's why I believe that time is not the healer of all wounds, because given a lot of time, often what happens is the brain just runs rampant mm -hmm. and that what actually heals wounds is doing the work. It's, yeah. It doesn't sound, it's not as catchy. Doing the work heals the wounds. It, it doesn't sound as catchy as like time and time can be passed watching Netflix and right. have no healing happen. Right. A lot of time has passed, right. but no healing has happened because right. the healing only happens when you go in and do the work. And exactly. so again, you went in and you did that work and you made this discovery about your own subconscious belief. Once you understood that you had this belief that you'd been carrying for four and a half decades, then what was the next thing? Like, how did you take the next step once you understood? So if somebody has an understanding, what's the next thing that they do? You have to start moving forward with your fear. So you give yourself a new empowering belief. So in my case, it was, I am safe and healthy alone. I'm safe and happy alone. I put it on a sticky note. 
I etch it into my brain. I do tapping. I do all kinds of affirmations. So I see it all the time. And then you make action. Life does not happen with, without action. You have to put the action to yep. the belief. So I started to go to dinner once in a while and sit at a bar by myself. And then I went on a back roads trip by myself. And then I went and climbed Kilimanjaro by myself. I flew to Africa and climbed Kilimanjaro with a group of people I didn't know. And amazing. So, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Amazing. I just have to say, because you're just like, well, I did this. And then I did this. Like you didn't just, though, for some people sitting at a bar alone might be their deepest fear. But I've just got to say, okay, this is amazing. You flew halfway around the world and said, I want to do this. I'm going to do it. I, yeah. I, sorry. I just had to. And I still, it's interesting because I have girlfriends that travel alone, really travel alone a lot. And when I travel alone, I do go to group things. Like I do a bike trip with a back roads group, or I went to this beautiful spa in Thailand. Like I did some amazing things. But once I was there, I was more set up that there'd be people. But still, I still did all those things and left my family and my thing and went off and climbed Kilimanjaro at 61 years old and rocked it and loved it. Those are the things you have to create new beliefs. You have to do positive affirmations. And, and if you don't know what tapping is or etching is, you can Google those things. And I, even, I think on my YouTube, I have I have a whole tapping exercise. But you're doing things to change the neurons in your brain, a new pathway. So instead of believing you're not safe alone, you're not safe alone, yeah, like this in your brain, now you've got a new one. I am safe alone. I am safe alone. I am safe alone. And then you put action to it. And the more times you do it, it creates more confidence. Action does create confidence. Mm -hmm. And the power, I know you said, well, I'm not really alone because I go there and I'm with all these people. But if some, if you were still in that place of subconsciously believing that you weren't safe alone, you wouldn't have made the connections. You know, you Correct. wouldn't have gone there because you would have felt alone just in making the booking. And I absolutely believe that the confidence comes from the actions because when you do it, I mean, you, you did Kilimanjaro at 61. You don't even look 61 though. I, I don't even know what 61 is anymore. Right. Like age just seems so meaningless now, but that's, but just the physiological of like me at 51, my body is not the same as it was. It does not take the abuse. Like that is a physical feat mm. that men and women of half your age may not have been able to do. So it's a strength on so many levels. And now you forever will be a person who summited Kilimanjaro. You will forever yeah. have that. It's true. But it must be the most amazing feeling when you come up against something to be able to draw from such a deep well. Yeah. And I trained for six months and every scary thing I did, you know, I went to Tony Robbins and I walked on fire and I ski double black diamonds. I did all kinds of things. And every single thing I did, I would say, well, if you don't do this, you won't be able to climb Kilimanjaro. Like these are all things you have to try. Yeah. A lot of self-talk. Here's the thing. You always feel so proud of yourself on the other side of trying something, whether you win or lose, the fact that you tried it boosts your morale, boosts your self-confidence, self-love, self-trust. That's the gift. That's why I say the, ju the juice is in the journey because just doing it makes you feel so proud of yourself. Yeah, I believe it. I really do. I love this story. I love this conversation. It's so hard when you're in the middle of it to be grateful for the day-to-day -day process of working through the discomfort. Mm until you're on the other side. Yeah, and except that I have gotten to the point where I recognize the feeling of the fear of going on a podcast or I was on extra TV or I do these master classes. Like some of the things to somebody else might look like, oh, it's nothing. I have some fear around it. I don't even say that anymore because being afraid, being nervous and being excited, nervous and excited, they give off the exact same chemicals in your body, but mm. it's different feeling. So don't even say you're nervous. Just say you're excited. Change what you say. Sometimes I say I'm nerve sighted, you know, like I try not to say ever that I'm nervous. It's the same cortisol. Everything's going to be the same that happens to your body, but it, the mindset is different. So just say I'm excited. 
I'm excited I'm going to get the opportunity to do this, even though deep down you're really scared to do it, but you're now you're just being excited about it. And then you do it and you, you can feel how good you're going to feel on the other side. It's such a relief to get on the other side. I go through that right now with launching a podcast. Right. Right. Yeah. But if you know, Glennon Doyle, she has a word that I love and it's, it's very similar to yours. It's the scared and excited. So she calls it skited. Skited. Yeah. Yep. She's very skited. Sure. And I was like, yep, that's it. There are times like fear is a legitimate thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to walk down a dark alley at nighttime right. in a high right. crime rate area. Right. My exactly. fear is doing something good. It's telling me yes. that I need to keep myself protected, but being able to determine when that feared, scared, when it's actually much more about I'm getting out of my comfort zone, that's a little bit different. And that's when I think of it as being a little bit more a skated feeling <laughs> where I'm scared, but there's also this bit of excitement of launching into the unknown. And sometimes... I found on my journey, there have been times when I don't recognize it at the time, but blind terror <laughs> could be, could be the feeling. And that is often grounded more in very deep beliefs. When you do the shadow work and I, you said briefly about the onion, that sometimes you feel like you've got a handle on what the belief is, mm -hmm. but then underneath there's another layer mm -hmm. because there's so many layers to these, your two-year-old self could right. comprehend something, the four-year-old layered on top of that, and it keeps building bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Over time, I'll think, oh, this is what it is, but it's actually a whole nother layer down. And that's when I'll have panic attacks, which I didn't allow myself to even use that language because I had so disconnected. Mm. I wouldn't say I was having a panic attack. I'd just be like, I need to go lie down. Right. To not even have the language. So I'm really appreciating the stories that you're telling, showing what it's like to be on the other side. And I'm sure that there are many things that you are still working on because it's not like Always. we get to an end point. Never. Not if you don't plan on staying on the couch and just watching Netflix for the rest of your life. You know, there's yeah. a saying, the last man in a race still beats the man on the couch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's no growth from your couch. You have to get out there. You have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Another really important point in all of this is to become the observer instead of the reactor to everything that happens in your life. When somebody triggers you, that's your wounded child that's being triggered. And therefore, your next reaction is going to be childish. You're going to write this mean text or you're going to call mm -hmm. them or you're going to you know, stop talking to them or you're going to ruminate for 72 hours. And all of that is really the reaction of your wounded child. So if you can step back, and say, wow, okay, what should I be learning here? Or what am I reacting to? What triggered me in that? What's the quality in that person that is so upsetting to me? Or what could that person have meant, but that's not how I'm interpreting it? When you start to diagnose, and again, use yourself as a laboratory, you remove yourself from that wounded child's position, and you get to use your conscious adult brain, and then you can respond instead of react. I have never heard it explained that way. And that just hit so hard mm. because I've had that happen where I react. Mm -hmm. And when you say it's the wounded child, and then because after I react, I have the shame of my reaction. Right. Because once time passes, what was I thinking? Like, oh why, did, why I did I do I that? Why did I say that? Right. Yeah. Like, like, what was I thinking? Because now I'm in my adult space, but it was actually three-year-old, five-year-old, seven-year-old Tatiana. Great. Right. And it's, it's a, oh, the shame of lashing out when someone hurts you. I used to do it all the time. All oh, the boy. time. I was like mean, mean, you know, I could be a mean girl. And now I may still think that thought, like with my boyfriend, I might think I want to say something, but I don't say it. And then I think about it and I, I take my part in it. You know, why, why is it upsetting me? And then a day or two later, when I do bring it up, I don't have all that energy around it anymore. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't even have to bring it up. Where the old me used to think, oh no, if it's on my mind, it's got to come out my mouth. Well, that's not really true. 
Exactly. Exactly right. So, but first I just wanted to say again, I've never heard it explained that way. You have just given me a gift because it it helps me to think, oh gosh, I did that thing. That's an inner wound that I need to explore. I forgive myself for reacting that way right? so that I don't have to feel the shame Mm -hmm. of my reaction because otherwise I'm reacting to my reaction. It's just a chain. It's just boom, react. Boom, react to the reaction. Boom. And it just keeps going. But this way I can stop it and say, no, I reacted and I forgive myself for that. I need to actually go in and see what that was all about. Right. But if you do what I'm saying, you're going to save the shame because you're not going to have the reaction. Exactly. Save yourself from the reaction. I think that I do that now at this point in my life, most of the time. You just gave me words and tools. Now I have a way of reflecting more and because even gritting my teeth is a reaction instead of moving into the okay that just triggered something right exactly. yeah get curious there's a great book out there by michael singer called the untethered soul and that's where it all comes from i just picked up that book a little bit ago it's on my bedside table and i talked with a friend yesterday and we both said yesterday yes we're going to read that that's our next book that we're reading together great book i've read it many times and every time i read it i hear something differently which is really interesting what we were saying before i think it was before this we got on the air about you have to be ready to hear something to receive it instead of wishing In the past, oh, I wish I had known that. I wish I had said that. I wish I had these tools then. If you were ready for them, you would have gotten them. You get them when you're ready to receive them. Yeah. I have the same experience with books. I'll reread books, Mm -hmm. like really good, powerful books. And I'll think, oh, I loved this book. I got so much from it. And then I'll read it again. And I'm like, there was a whole layer here that I missed. That's exactly what happened with The Untethered Soul. I've read it three times. And I listened to it now and I was listening to it like two weeks ago. And I thought, if you had asked me what the book was about, I would never have mentioned this part. I didn't even remember that that was the in this book. And it's a huge part of the book. It's all about an open heart. So you're going to see when you read it, how often he talks about the open heart. But all I remembered was the reactor and the observer. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Let me know when you're done. And I will probably be sharing it on the podcast. It's my intention to have a book of the month. Oh, good. That's a good one. So another thing that we had talked about was now you understand some of your triggers. You're starting to do some of the shadow work. And I feel like the next phase is once you have this understanding of yourself and your needs is healthy boundary setting. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you hear talked about a lot. And it's still something we as women who've been conditioned to be the nurturers, the care providers of the children. So setting healthy boundaries can feel really uncomfortable. Yes. So again, we're back to the get comfortable with being uncomfortable because there's short-term discomfort for long-term gratification. So ask yourself, how long are you going to be okay with the intolerable? How long are you going to not set healthy boundaries and just put up and shut up and disappear? Because that's what help happens. So setting healthy boundaries, a boundary is actually what you will and will not tolerate. It's the delineation between where one person ends and another person starts. And so setting healthy boundaries is not just with other people. It's with yourself. What are you no longer going to tolerate with yourself? How many times are you going to say you're going to diet or exercise or meditate, or save money. And then a week later, you don't even remember that you made yourself that promise. It happens all the time. So setting healthy boundaries is first and foremost with yourself. What are you no longer going to tolerate with yourself? How are you going to stay in integrity with what you tell yourself? Because that's what it comes down to. And then if you need to set healthy boundaries with other people, Look to see where are you angry? Where are you frustrated? Where are your needs not getting met? And then that will start to tell you where there's a boundary that you are crossing. Because the reality is nobody can cross your boundary except for you. So if you if there's an area where you're feeling frustrated or your needs aren't being met or people are leaving dirty dishes in the sink and it's making you crazy, but they're doing it over and over and over again, that's a perfect place to set a boundary. I use boundary scripts, which are, I feel X, when you do Y, would you be willing to do Z? 
I feel disrespected when you leave dishes in the sink. Would you be willing to just put them in the dishwasher? Simple. Mm-hmm. And then if they don't do it, it's you and you let and you just let it go. Then you're crossing the boundary because you can't really make anybody else cross the boundary. You can hope that they will, but you have to have a plan B. Well, in order to honor and respect myself, you're not doing it. So I'm going to get by paper plates so you can just throw them out. And I'm no longer available for you to use regular plates. Or you're in business and you say to a a coworker, I feel really upset when you talk over me in a Zoom meeting. Would you be willing to wait till I'm done before you step in? And in order to honor and respect myself, the next time it happens, I'm going to just in the meeting say, I'm sorry, Joe, I wasn't finished speaking. So that's you setting a healthy boundary and then having the next step if they don't do it. And boundaries are about everything. Now, the reason why boundaries are so hard is because of our shadow beliefs. If you were brought up that love and life means taking care of everyone before yourself, then you don't know how to make yourself a priority. You feel guilty making yourself a priority. You think selfish is a bad word and selfless is a good word, and that's not true. They're on a spectrum and you've got to be selfish sometimes and you have to be selfless sometimes. But if you're always selfless, you disappear. You have no needs. So then you you have no self. You have no self. You have no needs. Nobody knows your needs because you don't even know them and you don't make them a priority. So just like stepping out of your comfort zone and doing something you're afraid to do, when you start to set boundaries, you feel amazing. You're so proud of yourself. I had a client who wasn't on the title. She'd been with somebody for 15 years, but she wasn't on the title of the house. And it really bothered her. She felt very disempowered, but she'd never asked to be on it. Mm. And when she asked with ease and flow of a boundary script, it was taken care of just like that. She was amazed. Many times we fear the reaction of the other person, but the other person is actually happy to give us what we need if we just ask for it. And the other thing you have to know is that somebody else's reaction to your truth is not your problem. It's their problem. If you ask for what you need and they get upset and stomp out of the room, well, then that's what they do. I have clients that have to say to their husband, I'm afraid when you have more than two drinks, would you be willing to stop at two drinks? And the next time you have more than two drinks, I'm going to be sleeping in the bedroom alone. I'm going to go in the bedroom and lock the door and spend the night. So that's setting a healthy boundary and having a plan B. Mm -hmm. That answer your question? Oh boy. There was a lot of meat there. And other people's reactions are not your responsibility. Right. I think this is one of the toughest lessons. It's, it's one I struggle with. I know in my head, but my body still has a reaction when somebody crosses it. I worry and, and I get anxious and I take on their reaction and try to calm them. But that's the discomfort in maintaining the boundary. That's the discomfort of regardless of what their reaction is, it's not actually mine. It's my boundary and their reaction is not something that I own. It's not something I'm responsible for, but it feels uncomfortable for me because Mm -hmm. I'm doing something different than what I did in the past. Right. In the past, I'd, yeah. I'd set a boundary, but everybody sort of knew that it was kind of a boundary, but not really, right. because a boundary isn't a boundary if it's sometimes there and it sometimes isn't. No. That's that's not a boundary. That's no. a pervious surface. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And I, I've said something sometimes and people will say, well, you're so judgmental or that was so mean or whatever. And I think, no, it's just my truth. And I'm sorry that it upsets you. I, my, I wasn't trying to upset you. But your reaction to my truth is not my responsibility. It's yours. Yeah. I'm telling you what I need. If that upsets you, I'm sorry, but I'm going to do what I need to do. Yeah. This has been such a monumental shift. When I talk to my millennial friends, Mm -hmm. I'm Gen X and I have friends of various generations. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there is more understanding of boundaries and acceptance and articulation of them. I feel with my children who are Gen Z, that even more so, they're saying we will not tolerate this. Right. I'm so hopeful. I'm so hopeful that I haven't yeah. passed on some of my, what I consider my deficiencies. We all I'm are. a work in progress. 
You have just poured wisdom today. I'm so excited for others to get to hear your voice and your wisdom. Thank what you. is the best way for anybody that really just feels compelled to reach out to you after hearing you speak? You might just resonate so deeply with them as you did with me when I heard you. What is the best way for them to reach you? My website has like how to contact me free discovery calls. You can read all, you can see all my podcasts. You can see all my courses that I teach. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and I do group coaching and I have a new course out called tools and strategies for business success. It's on a platform for women only called Gen Connect You. And I sent you a code 20% off for anybody who wants that course. The code is BBB for bigger, better, braver, BBB success. So you can offer that to all your listeners. I also gave you a free chapter to my book. So the least expensive way to work with me is to just read my book. And then I actually have another course that's online, totally evergreen called bigger, better, braver that they can do on their own. That's also really relatively very inexpensive. And then it goes up to coaching with me which is Fantastic. the thing I love the most. So. Oh, I bet. I bet. I mean, I feel like I've just learned so much just from getting mm. to interview you for the podcast. Thank you. So I will have all of this information in the show notes so that people are able to find you. I'll have your website up there. They'll have the code for the discount. They'll be able to connect with you, follow you and do all the great things. Yeah. And on Wednesday mornings, um, Mountain Standard Time at eight o'clock. I do a um, a clubhouse room on how to stop self sabotage. So anybody can listen to that. It's free. You can we laser coach on that. Anyone can ask any questions they want. There's three or four of us that are moderating it together. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Nancy. You're it has been welcome. an absolute pleasure. I've enjoyed myself. Thank you. for the recap. What an amazing conversation with Nancy. We covered a breadth of topics, but it always circled back to the shadow beliefs. Here are a few highlights. Shadow beliefs are formed in your first 10 years and they're part of your subconscious mind. And these subconscious beliefs become part of your brain's operating system. The only way to change shadow beliefs is to uncover them and bring them into the conscious mind. Then we start to explore why they were formed. Once you understand why these beliefs formed, the next step is to look at how holding on to these beliefs are impacting you today. Nancy gave the example of a child who'd been made fun of for their speaking and how they turned that into a belief that keeping quiet meant keeping safe. But over time as an adult, they kept quiet and then kept getting passed over for promotions because no one saw them. Their belief was no longer keeping them safe it was keeping them small and it was even hindering their development and their progress. And here is why these shadow beliefs are so persistent. It's because how the brain works is that it always wants to know things. So it will go to the thing that it knows, even if it's not good for you. So if you know how to keep quiet and not speak up, then it feels incredibly difficult to speak up and promote your ideas. And so the shadow belief persists. But in reality, whether you fall on your face or succeed, there are lessons and gifts in both. This is why to overcome these shadow beliefs, we need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Really, we talked about five steps to addressing the shadow beliefs, and they were one, identify the belief. Two, understand the negative impact the belief is having on your life today. Three, give yourself a new empowering belief to replace the old disempowering belief. Four, Help your brain adopt the new belief by building new neural pathways. This can be done through affirmations and tapping, but most important is to take action. So while the first four are important, this fifth step is critical, and this is the action step. The brain needs proof that the empowering belief is true. In Nancy's case, she started to go out into the world in smaller and then larger ways. She went on her own and proved to her brain that she could be alone and that she was safe to be alone. And finally, we talked about that old bugaboo boundaries. Healthy boundaries can cause short-term discomfort, but you get long-term gratification. 
but what holds us back from making or holding boundaries, it's often our shadow beliefs. When you are triggered or upset by something, or maybe a boundary is being pushed against and you want to acquiesce, whatever your response is, stop. Stop and try and be the observer of your response. Instead of reacting, simply observe. That feeling of being triggered, it's your wounded child. There is an unhealed wound there, a belief. This is an opportunity to explore. Pausing and observing and responding when you can use your adult brain, that is the work. Identifying and doing further exploration of the trigger, that is doing the work. These are the steps to moving past the pain and disempowering beliefs and doing your healing. Thank you so much for listening to Happyish. These conversations nourish my soul, and I hope they nourish yours as well. And I've also been asked, how do I share the podcast with my friends? Well, if you're on Spotify, go to the episode and you can click the upward facing arrow or the three dots beside it. These are located right below the image of the episode. Both the three dots or the upward facing arrow give you an option to copy the link or share directly. On Apple Podcasts, they also have the three dots, but they are located in the lower right corner and that's where you can share or scroll down and copy the link. So happy sharing. And again today, I'm sending you much love on your journey.